So we're going to get started. We'll start even though it's not uh, exactly the time yet. We're about two-thirds down on Daf Tesvav and Manalev. We had learned yesterday that there's a machlokas between the Chachamim and Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel that when you have an Evid Kanani who is hektish, who is temple property, normally temple property that you use for personal use, you've committed an act what's called me'ila, you have to bring a carbon. But that's only true with chattel, not with real estate. And Evid has the din of real estate. What about the hair of the Evid that he's ready to get a haircut? He's got long hair, he's ready to get a haircut. Does that hair have the status of the Evid's body, or is it considered to be a separate, disconnected part that is considered to be chattel, such that if I use the Evid's hair, but not the rest of the Evid, I'm liable for an act of mi'ila. This was a machlokas between the Chachamim and Rav Shimon and Leo. The Chachamim say it's part of his body, so just like for the Evid, you don't commit mi'ila, so to his hair. But then Shimon Gamliel says, no, his hair, you do commit an act of me, let's consider it separate from his body. And then the Gemara says, Nema honey tanoi ka honey tanoi. Let us therefore suggest that the same machlokas between these two is, is in the following brisa. That non Rabbi Meir Omer, yesh devarim shein kekarka ve'en in kekarka ve'en chacham imodim lo. Rabbi Meir says there are certain things that are growing from the ground but are not considered connected, uh, cannot, not considered real estate. And the Chachamim disagree, and they say, anything that's growing from the ground is called real estate. Ketza, what's the illustration? Eser gefanim tu'unos masarti l'cha v'halo omer enon el chamesh. Rebbe Meir mechayev v'chachamim omrim kol ha-mechubra l'karka hariu kekarka. The machlokas is as follows. We know there's a law called moda v'mikzas. If I claim you owe me 100, and you claim you owe me 50, you pay me 50, plus you have to swear, you have to take a shavua on the other 50 that you don't owe. But that's only true if the claim is on money or chattel. If the claim is on real estate, I gave you 100 acres. And you say, no, I only have to, you only gave me 50 acres. I don't have to pay you for 50. So then there's no shvua on karka. What happens if the claim is on a piece of land that has vines? I say that the, there were 10 vines laden with grapes. And you say, no, there were only five vines laden with grapes. So is this a case of karka? Or is this a case of chattel? So according to Rebbe Meir, this is a case of chattel, mm -hmm. in which case there is an obligation of a shavuah. And according to the Chachamim, no, it's just like any other real estate where there's no shavuah. And the machlokis, according to Rebbe Yossi, is like this. We're talking about grapes that are immediately ready, they're ripe, they're ready to be harvested. So <clears throat> Rabbi Meir says, since they're ready to be harvested, they're considered to be disconnected from real estate, and therefore they're like chattel, which is why you have to take a shvua. And the Chachamim say, no, as long as it's still connected to the karka, it's like karka. So we want to suggest that it's the same machlokas with the hair on the Evid. The, the Chachamim will be like the Chachamim there, and they'll say that as long as the hair is connected to an Evid, it's like the, it's like the Evid himself, and therefore there's no act of me'ilah. And Rabbi Meir over here goes like Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, who says that just like the hair is it's ready for a haircut, so it's considered disconnected, so to here the grapes are considered disconnected. So lo. So the says not necessarily. Because a filutema Rabbi Meir, Atkan lo kama Rabbi Meir hasam, kol kama de shafkal hu mikhash kachashi. Aval sa'aro kol kama de shafkal hu ashbuche meshabeach. Mora says that's not necessarily a good analogy. It could be that Rebbe Meir might agree to the Chachamim when it comes to the hair case. The reason why Rebbe Meir holds that grapes that are fully ripened are no longer considered part of real estate is because if you leave them on the vine any longer, they actually go bad. They start to um, diminish in quality. Hair, if you leave it on the head, does not diminish in quality. It's just that it keeps on growing. But there's no diminution of quality. So it could be only in a case of, in the case of the grapes, does Rebbe Mayer hold that they're no longer connected to the real estate. <coughs> but it could be by hair, mm -hmm. since there's no diminution of quality by letting it stay on the head, it's still considered to be part of the Evid, and therefore there's no meat. Next, Dine Nefashos Chule. So this next piece of Gemara is going on the halacha that the Mishnah had stated, that when there's an act of bestiality committed, then both the human being and the animal are put to death with a Sanhedrin of 23 that have to act as the judges. 
And the Gemara now says, Kapasik Vitani Loshna Roveya Zachar, Veloshna Roveya Nikeva. Now the Mishnah had said that this applies to when an act is when an animal is the one who is mounting the human. And the human allows the animal to mount it or brings the animal upon itself to be mounted, so the human is liable for the death penalty, as is the animal. And here the Mishnah makes no distinction whether it's a female who allows herself to be mounted by an animal or whether it's a male who allows himself to be mounted homosexually by an animal. So uh, w- the question then is, Bishlama Roveya Nekeva Dechseva So I understand the source to tell me that an animal who commits an act of bestiality with a woman, when he mounts a woman, he's put to death with a basin of 23 because the Pasuk explicitly connects the woman who is complicit to the animal. It says, you shall kill both the woman and the animal. But where do we know that when a male allows himself to be mounted by an animal, then the animal there also is executed with a basin of 23. There's no Pasuk to indicate that. So the answer is that we have an extra pasuk in the Torah that says, "Kol shochev im behima mos yimas." Now that is that anyone who lies with an animal shall die. Now we have, uh, and we already have a pasuk that it says that any man who lies with an animal shall be put to death. So why do you need this pasuk? It's coming to tell you that even when the man is not the mounter, but the man is the mountee, then, he, uh, then the animal is, has the same judgment as the human being. Just like when a man mounts an animal, both he and the animal are subject to the death penalty, so too when a man is mounted by the animal, both he and the animal are subject to the death penalty and therefore require a basin of 23. And that's why the Torah uses it in a language of where the man is the mounter to tell you that the halacha of the mountee, a man who's a mountee, is equivalent to the halacha where the man is the mounter. Okay, let's go weiter. Shor haniskal be'esrim u'shlosha, shenemar hashor yisokel ve'gamba olav yumas, kemisas ha'ba'olim kach nisas ha'shor. The Mishnah had told us that when an animal gores and kills, the animal is put to death with a basin of 23 judges. And where do I know this from? It's written in the Torah. It says... <coughs> the ox shall die, and shall be stoned, rather, and so too his master, the owner of the ox, shall be put to death. But what we learn from there is not that the owner is put to death, but rather that just like a human being would be judged for death with a basin of 23, so too when an ox is stoned to death, it requires a basin of 23. So, so Abaya asks a very simple, straightforward question. How do you know that this Pasuk is telling me that just like when a human being is put to death, he requires a basin of 23, the same applies to this animal who's stoned? Maybe the Pasuk should be read in a much more straightforward fashion. The animal is put to death. We don't care how he's put to death. doesn't require a basin of 23. But also, the owner has to be put to death because he is responsible for the death of somebody else because of his animal. Maybe that's what the Pusik means, and it's not reflective at all on how many judges are required for the death penalty of an ox. Gemara says that's not possible because in Cain lichto vegamba alo velishto. Because if that's what all the Torah meant to imply, it should have said as follows Ashor yisakel, the ox shall be stoned, and so to its owner. Period. The word shall die or shall be put to death is unnecessary. So that word shall be put to death is written ex- extraneously to connect the halacha of putting a human to death to the halacha of putting an ox to death. Wait a minute. of hava That's not a good answer. If the Torah would have left out the word shall be put to death, you must, I might have thought that just like an ox is stoned to death for having killed a human, so too its owner is stoned to death. And therefore the Torah has to write you must to tell me that the death penalty is not stoning. It's a lesser form of death penalty. Wait a minute. Biskila salkadaitach? Katal iu mamono biskila? 
Why would you ever think such a thing, says the Gemara? When a person himself commits murder, he gets a lesser death penalty than stoning. He gets death by the sword. So why would I think that when his ox kills somebody, he should get stoned? You would never think such a thing. And therefore, Yumas, once again, is extraneous. The deal mahai the cost of Rahmana Yumas La Akule Iluya La Afuke Messiah Lichenek. No. Maybe the word Yumas is coming to tell me no. Taka, the owner of the animal, is put to death. But since he himself did not commit the act of murder, but rather his ox did, give him a lighter form of death penalty. A first degree murderer gets death by the sword. A murderer via ox gets a lesser death penalty of strangulation. Maybe that's what the word yumas means. It's got nothing to do with <coughs> reflecting on the law of what happens to the ox. But hanich lamando amar chenek chamur, el lamando amar chenek kil ma'ikal amemar. Well, if you say, there's a whole discussion later on in Sanhedrin, what's the hierarchy of severity of death penalty? We know there are four types of death penalties, right? We know that skila is the most severe. But what is the least severe? So there's a machlokis as to whether death by the sword is more severe and strangulation is less severe, or vice versa. If you hold that chenek is more severe than death by the sword, so then it makes sense that this pasuk is not coming to be lenient because death by the sword is the most lenient form of death penalty. But if you say that chenek is a lesser form, is a less severe form of death penalty, so then you have a problem. Maybe the word yumas is not at all reflective on the death penalty of the ox, but rather is reflective on the fact that an owner of an ox who kills gets the death penalty, but a lesser form of death penalty of death by strangulation. So the Gemara says, Lo salka daitach, t'tsivim kofer yushas alav, v'i salka daitach bar ketolohu, v'haksiv lo sikhu chofer l'nefesh rotzeach. So the Torah says that's not possible. You can't possibly uh, even read a pasuk to think that an owner of an animal who kills gets put to death. Why? Because the Torah in the very same context says, if monetary assessment is placed upon him, the owner, then he shall pay what the assessment is. Now, we know that a person can never pay money in lieu of getting the death penalty. That's called blood money. We, the Torah does not allow blood money. It doesn't say, there's no such situation in the Torah where you can pay your way out of getting the death penalty. So if the Torah says that one, at, at least one possible option for a guy whose ox murders is payment, so then it has to be that there's no death penalty associated to the owner. But wait a minute, Adaraba, Mishum Higufa Kotal Ihu Lotiski Bimamona, Ela Bikatala Kotal Shoro, Lifrok Nafshi Bimamona. Maybe not. Maybe I'll just I'll look at it just the opposite. Maybe when the Torah says there's no such thing as blood money is when the person himself is the murderer. Because that's the context, that no one should ever think that he can get out of being put to death when he murders by paying off somebody. But maybe that's only true when he himself commits murder. But maybe when his ox c kills somebody, in which case he's not as culpable, maybe there is the, such an idea of blood money. That we, the halacha would be, you, you're, if your ox kills somebody, you, get to, you, you are put to death unless you can come up with payment to the family. Maybe that's what the Torah means. So the Gemara says, We have to resort to another Pasuk. This Pasuk talks about murder, and it's written in, in the language of miut, of exclusivity, and it tells me that only when a person himself commits first-degree murder, he is put to death, but not when he commits murder in any other way. Only when you yourself commits, commit murder can you get the death penalty, but you can't get the death penalty for when your ox or other property commits an act of murder. And that's how we know that when the Torah says, Vigamba all of yumas, it is not at all meaning to tell me the simple meaning that the owner gets put to death. It therefore is reflective upon the status of the shore stoning. That just like when a person gets put to death, he needs to be judged in the basin of 23, so too when the ox is stoned, he needs to be judged in the basin of 23. Interesting theoretical question. It's really theoretical because it's a historical question. We know that at Maimed Har Sinai, Moshe told the people 
um, that in behema im ish lo yichyeh, that no animal or human may approach the mountain, and if they do, they will not live; they will die. So the question is, in that in that historical event, if an ox had approached Har Sinai, it would be put to death. Would it require a basin of twenty three or not? Do we learn? that just like the general halacha in the Torah that was about to be given requires 23 judges for an ox that's liable for the death penalty, so to there, or perhaps that was a special case. So, Tashma detoni rami bar yecheskel im behima imish lo yichye ma'ish bechav gimel af behima bechav gimel. Rami bar yecheskel's price states that the language of the Pasuk implies that there too the Torah equates the law of human execution to the law of animal execution in Behema Imish. Behema is connected to Ish. Just like an Ish would need 23 to put it to death, so too a Behema would need 23 as well. Next, Ha'ari Ha'ze'ev V'chule. The Mishnah had taught us that a lion and a wolf and a skunk or some other wild animal and a snake uh, and, uh, and other kinds of and panthers, if a person is, uh, is killed by any of these things and, the, and that animal has an owner so that animal too also has to be judged in a basin of 23 before it is stoned to death and Rabbi Eliezer in our Mishnah disagreed and Rabbi Eliezer said what are you talking about anyone who jumps the gun first and kills that animal is getting merit in other words he, he wins so he says it's a special case only by a shore, but by wild animals, go ahead and kill them. So, Amoresh Lakish, Vahu Shehimisu, Valohimisu Lo, Alma Kasavra, Yeshlam Targus, Vieshlam Balam. Resh Lakish says, Here's how you have to understand Rabbi Eliezer. He's not telling you that if your friend has a pet cobra, that you can go ahead while he's walking the cobra one day and just shoot it willy nilly. No, that's not true. Rish Lakir says you have, it is possible to domesticate a wild animal. So it's only that you can kill the animal after it's actually killed somebody. You know, we have court cases today in the U.S. and in Canada about people who are domest- trying to domesticate while a person has a chimpanzee. And then one day the chimp goes wild and tears off a person's face, right? So how do you deal with those cases in, in secular law? The Gemara is actually dealing with this situation now as well. Reish Lakish says, it's possible to domesticate a wild animal, and it's therefore possible to declare yourself the owner of an animal that's domesticated, even if it's normally in the wild. And therefore, just because a guy has a wolf or a snake doesn't give you a right to just walk over and shoot it. It's if the animal commits murder, then Rabbi Eliezer says you have a right to kill it, but not before. But Rabbi Yochanan Omar Rabbi Yochanan degrees just the opposite. He says, no, what our mission, what Rabbi Eliezer really is telling us is, is that there's no such thing as the ability to domesticate a wild animal. You see a guy bring a wolf into his house, you can take your shotgun, walk over and just shoot the animal. And with complete impunity, because there's no such thing as ownership of a wild animal. Is because you can't domesticate a wild animal. And therefore, you don't have to wait for the animal to kill somebody. Just go over and kill it because you're, doing, you're, you're, you're helping society. You're protecting society from wild creatures. Tanan. I wonder what they would say about raccoons. I think raccoons is a big thing in Canada, no? <laughs> so Tanan. Rebbe Eliezer Omer kol hakodem lahor gonzach. So let's look at our Mishnah. The Mishnah's language was that according to Rebbe Eliezer, Whoever can get there first to kill the animal wins. That's what the word zacha. He wins. So Bishlam al Rabbi Yochanan Lamai Zacha Zacha La So Rabbi Yochanan, who says that the animal is ownerless, says it's a hefker wild animal, shoot it, and you get you win. You get to keep the pelt, take home the fur, make yourself a wolf skin rug, and you're really happy. But El Resh Lakish Lamai Zacha, Kevin Shehimisu, Shavinu Rabban and Kaman de Gomer Dinayu, Visuri Hanaaninu, Mai Zacha. But according to Reish Lakish, who says, no, that wolf is considered to be domesticated and owned by another person. If it kills somebody, then I have a right to kill it. But how do I win by killing it? I mean, after all, when we stone a, an ox, the halacha is, because it killed, the whole animal is aser bahana. You, no one can get any benefit from that animal, not even its hide. 
So how can how does Rebbe Eliezer, according to Reish Lakish, how does Rebbe Eliezer say you win? What do you win? You can't use the animal's hide according to Reish Lakish. So the answer is Zachal Hashemayim. It's not that you win something of value uh, on, the, on the financial market, but it's you win in the eyes of heaven. You've done a mitzvah. That's what it means, Zacha. Tanya Kavosid the Reish Lakish. And in the final analysis, we have a Bryce that supports Reish Lakish. Echot Shor Shehemis, Echot Behema Vachaya Shehemisu, Bechav Gimel. It makes no difference whether it's a shore that k- kills a, a human or any other animal that kills a human. According to the Chachamim, you need a basin of 23. But Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Shor Shehemis Be'esim Ushlosha, Ushar Behema Vachaya Shehemisu, Kol HaKoyim Lohar Gonzacha Bahem Lashamayim. But other animals, Rabbi Eliezer says, I disagree. With other animals, if they kill, then anyone who gets there first to kill the animal is a winner. And who do they win? They win in the he- on the eyes of heaven. So you see two things from the Bryson. Number one, you have to wait for the wolf or the snake to kill. And number two, the winning that you acquire is not that you get any part of the animal, but you win in the eyes of heaven. So this supports Resh Lakish's assertion that you have to wait until the animal kills. <coughs> Interesting, people today, they own pythons, they own all kinds of crazy animals, and then all of a sudden you read in the news, uh, little Tommy's python went ahead and snuck into the neighbor's uh, house, you know, and you know, and they created havoc. Okay, Rabbi Akiva Omer Chule. Rabbi Akiva now had said he was the third opinion in the Smachlokas. Remember, the Tanakhama said for every animal you need 23 judges. Rabbi Eliezer says no, it's only a special case by a shore, by all other animals. If it kills, kill it. And Rabbi Akiva now is the third opinion in the mission. He says no, you always need 23. So that seems to be the same thing as the Chachamim. So Rabbi Akiva Hainu Tanakama, what's the difference? Ika Beinaihu Nachash. The answer is a snake. That whereas the Tanakama holds that for all wild animals, they're domesticatable, including a snake, and if, if they kill, you need to have a basin of 23. Rabbi Akiva says, I agree with you with all animals except for the snake. The snake, I don't care how much you think you're going to be able to domesticate that snake and keep it, no. Every snake is a snake in the grass, and therefore just go ahead and kill it and, uh, and uh, you know, be done with it. Don't think that a snake, you can cohabit with a snake within society. That's absolutely impossible. We have elsewhere the talk in the Gemara about having snakes in the houses in Bovell. You'll have to show it to me. I don't remember that. Because it kills rats and things. It could be a different kind of snake. You know, it, could, it could be a non. It could be a non. A non poisonous snake. snake. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ain done in vechule. So the next thing that we saw was that when you want to judge an entire shavit, or if you want to do, if you want to judge a false prophet, or a kohen gadol, these are VIP situations, and therefore you can't just abide by a twenty-three uh, uh, judge court. You need the major Supreme Court of the Sanhedrin of 71 in order to judge these cases. So the first case is an entire shevet. So hai shevet dechata b'mai. What did the shevet do that needs a, a 71 based in? Ilayim shevet shechilo l'sashabes emar depolig rachmona ben yechinol l'merumen le'inyan avodas kolchavim v'shar mitzvus mi polig. Let's say it's any other kind of capital situation. Let's say an entire shevet was machalol shabbos. Is that a reason to judge them differently from the way that you would judge individuals? We have no precedent for that. The only precedent that we have to distinguish between a community and an individual sinner is in the case of Avodah Zarah, where the Torah talks about a case of Ir Hanidachas. When an entire city commits a, a idolatry, you judge them differently from an individual idolater. An individual idolater gets death by stone. An entire city of idolaters gets death by the sword. So there you see there's a distinction. Why would I think it should be by any other sin? So, Ella b'shevet shehudach. So you're right, says the Gemara. We're talking about an entire shevet that commits idolatry. And there they have to be judged with the Sanhedrin of 71. L'nemra de bedina de rabim dainin Keman, loka rebi yoshia v'loka rebi One second. According to what you're saying, our Mishnah goes like neither author of the following b'risa, who define what the parameters of an irhanidachas is, right? The Tanya ad kama usin irhanidachas miyud vi ad kuf diver Rabbi Yoshia and Rabbi Yonason omer mikufi ad rubo shel shevet. 
There's a machlokis. What's the definition of an ir hanidachas, an idolatrous city that is burned to the ground and all of its inhabitants are put to death by the sword? So the first opinion of Rabbi Yoshi is the population is anywhere from 10 to 100. Less than 10, they're judged as individuals. Larger than 100, they're judged as not no longer a, conf- a, 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 a confined city, but rather as a metropolis. And that's no longer a near Hanidachas. It's too much sprawl, okay? Too much urban sprawl, right? That's not a city anymore. But Rabbi Nassim says, you notice in the ancient world, populations were much smaller. And Rabbi Yonason says, minimum size of near Hanidachas is 100. Maximum size is the majority of a tribe. But the Gemara's point is, Afilu Reb Yonason lo ka'amar el aruba abal kula lo. That even Reb Yonason, who's the more liberal measurement, says only a majority of a tribe can be judged as near anidachas, where their judgment is different from individuals. But if it's an entire shevet, that too is too large even for Reb Yonason, and therefore they should no longer be judged as near anidachas. Their judgment should be as individuals, not as a community. So where do we get this idea that the judgment of an entire shevet is different? So Amar of Masna Hacha Benasi Shevet Shachata Askina. Because Milo Amar of Adabar Abba, Kol Hadabar Hagodol Yaviu Elecha, Debar of Shagodol, Hai Nami Godol Hu. So uh, Rav Masna says you totally don't understand the Mishnah. When the Mishnah says that a, a tribe is judged by a Sanhedrin of 71, it's not referring to an entire tribe that commits a sin, but the Nasi, the president of the tribe that commits a sin. As we'll see in a moment, any time you're dealing with a VIP, his judgment has to be done by the Supreme Court, by the Sanhedrin of 71. And therefore, just like a Kohen Gadol needs 71, so too a Nasi requires judgment of 71 when he commits something that involves a potentially capital, a capital offense. Okay, so that's what, that's what the Mishnah means. Ula Amar Rebelazer Ula says, I have a, d- a different answer. In reality, we are talking about an entire shevet, right? But the reason why we're talking, the reason why they're judged with 71 is because they're coming with a specific claim. Not that they're sinners, but they're coming with a claim. Let's say 500 years after Eretz Yisrael was divided and split, they come up with a claim that where they say, hey, the shevet next door encroached on our property and moved the markers of our boundaries without our knowledge about a hundred years ago, and now we want to get our, our property back. So they start up a whole new court case to say that our borders should be switched. In that situation, you need a Sanhedrin of 71, because just like when Eretz Yisrael was originally divided, you needed the Sanhedrin in order to divide it, so too any new claim of redivision from the status quo requires the Sanhedrin of 71. The Gemara says, but wait a minute, Ula. Imat chilaso klape ur and betum and bechol Yisrael, afkan klape ur and betum and bechol Yisrael? One second, Ula. It, it, when Eretz Yisrael was originally divided, the requirements were not just that the Sanhedrin be present, but you needed lotteries, and you needed the ur and betum and the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol to uh, prophetically state who got what, and you needed the presence of the entire Jewish populace to be present in this gathering to determine how the land would be divided. Is that what you're suggesting has to take place here also? There's no indication of that from the Mishnah. Ela machvartik the Rav Masa. Umar says, you know what, we're going to put aside your answer, Ula, because it's problematic, and we'll stick with Rav Masna's answer that we're dealing with the Nasi and not the Shevet itself. Ravino Amar la'olam b'Shevet Shehuda chudu kakashulach bedina de Rabbim dayninan lay in aflagav de katlinan biyachid Vedina de Rabim Dainina light. So Ravina has a different answer. He says, you know what? I like our original answer that we're talking about an entire Shabbat that commits Avodazara. Your question was, but no one holds that you should kill them by the sword like an Iranidachas. <coughs> That's true. They would be judged as individuals as far as what type of death penalty they get. But as far as what judiciary judges them. They are still judged uniquely by a Sanhedrin of 71 instead of a regular person who commits idolatry who requires only a Sanhedrin <coughs> of 23. And what's the reason? Because Milo Amar Reb Chama Reb Yossi Amar Reb Oshia Vehotzei Soes Ha'isha Hu Oes Ha'isha Ha'yi El She'arecha 
ish v'isha atamotze lisha arecha v'atamotze kolo yerkula lisha arecha hachanami ish v'isha atamotze lisha arecha v'iatamotze kolo shevet kulo lisha arecha. And the reason is based on the pasuk. Where do we know that there's such a concept of a regional Sanhedrin that can that can meet out execution? It's based on the pasuk that says that when a man or a woman uh, commits a sin, you bring them to the gates of your city and you put them to death there. That implies that there's a regional, local Sanhedrin that can mete out the death penalty. But there, it's speaking about individuals. Only individuals can be taken to the local, regional based in. But when you have an entire population of people, an entire <coughs> shaman, that's not just an Isha or an Isha, individual people, there you cannot take them to a regional based in. There they have to go to the Supreme Court in Yerushalayim the 71 Sanhedrin. And that's how I know. So you're right. Judging them like in Irhani Dachas, we're not going to do. We're going to give them the death penalty of stoning like any other individual idolater. But which body <coughs> judges them? That's the Sanhedrin of 71. Next, Lois Navi Hasheken. We also said that when you want to judge a false prophet who says that, he, that he's saying the word of God, and then it's discovered that he is not representing Hashem and he did not have a proper nevuah, he is judged by the Sanhedrin of 71 as well. Minahan Emili, where do we know this? Amar Rebbe Yossi Rebbe Chanina, Asya Hazada Hazada Mizakein Mamre. Malahalan Beshivim Ve'echad, Akan Beshivim Ve'echad. So the, the, the verb of deliberate, mazed, is mentioned both in the context of a Zakein Mamre and in the context of a false prophet. Right? It says by the false prophet, Achanavi Asher Yazid Ledaber Davar Vishni, if he shall deliberately, flagrantly try to misrepresent himself of speaking in my word. So you see the word mazid is used. And by a Zakein Mamre, by a person who rebels against the Sanhedrin and defies the Sanhedrin and tells people not to listen to the Sanhedrin, it says, Asher Ya'ase Vizadon. He shall commit this act Bizadon flagrantly. So therefore, just like a Zakein Mamre is only liable for the death penalty when he defies the Sanhedrin of 71, so too a Navi Sheker gets put to death by a Sanhedrin of 71. But wait a minute. Vaha Hazada ki kasiva biketalahu dechsiva uketala be'esrenu tlasahu. But one second, says the Gemara, that word mazid is not written in the context of his act of defiance. It's written in the context of how you punish him. And a Zakein Mamre does not need a basin of, 20, of 71 judges to put him to death. He only needs a basin of 23 to put him to death. So, if anything, that should be an indication, if you're making a Gezei Roshava from that word Hazada, that, that a Nabi Sheker only needs a basin of 23. Because the word uh, Bizadon is in the context of how he is punished for his crime. It's true, his crime is defying the Sanhedrin of 71, but his penalty is death by a Sanhedrin of 23. So where do you see that a Navi Sheker gets put to death by a Sanhedrin of 71? So Ella Amar Reish Lakish Komar Dover Dover Mehamra Asa. So the answer is, is that the Gzeir Shabbat is not from the word mazid, but rather it's from the word davar. In both Psukim, the word davar is used. It says by the Navi Sheker, Acha Navi Asher Yazid Lidaber Davar Bishmi. If the false prophet shall flagrantly say a word in my name. And by the, um, by the Zakein Mamre, it says, The Asisa Al Piha Davar Asher Yagidu Lecha. You shall act according to the Davar that, that they shall tell you. And therefore, if the Zakein Mamre defies them, therefore he's defied their Davar. Now, the word Davar in that context is not referring to the penalty to the Zakein Mamre, but it's referring to the crime that he commits of flagrantly defying the Sanhedrin of 71. And therefore, now it's appropriate to say that just like his defiance involved 71 judges, so too the Navi Sheker's uh, misrepresentation must also involve 71 judges. But now the Gemara says, okay, you've got a good Gzei Roshava. The Ligmar Hazada Hazada Mi Navi HaSheker. So now I got a question. We know that every Gzei Roshava works reciprocally. Once I can say that A applies to B, then I can also say that the halachas of B apply to A. Once I know 
that a Navi Sheker requires a Sanhedrin of 71 in order to be executed, why don't I now re- reciprocate and say that if a Navi Sheker requires 71 judges to be put to death, the same halacha now should go back and apply to the Zakein Mamri. You should need 71 judges to put him to death. And we never find that in our Mishnah that the Zakein Mamri needs 71. So the Gemara answer is, Dover, Dover, Gamir, Hazada, Hazada, Lo Gamir. The answer is, is that you would need the Gzeir Shava to apply to the penalty portion of the Pasuk. And that, the, this Artan of our Mishnah, does not have a Mesorah for. What Rashi explains is, in order to be able to make a legitimate Gzeir Shava, you have to have a Mesorah. You can't just take two Psukim and say, oh, they share a word, and therefore I'm going to connect their halachas together. No one is allowed to innovate a Gzeir Shava on their own. Because otherwise we would end up with crazy halachic uh, <laughs> conclusions. A Gzeir Shava is based on a Mesorah that you get from your Rebbe and his Rebbe from his Rebbe back until Moshe Rabbeinu. If you don't have a Mesorah for Gzeir Shava, you can't adduce any new halacha. So our Tana has a Gzeir Shava to make from the word Davar Davar to connect the crime of the Zakein Mamre to the crime of the Navi Sheker. But he does not have a Gzeir Shava to connect the penalty of the Navi Sheker to the penalty of the Zakein Mamre, and therefore we have no reason, we have no right to uh, adduce that a, a Zakein Mamre gets the death penalty by 71. Let us go weiter. Velo es Kohen Gadol. That a Kohen Gadol also must be judged by a, 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 by a court of 71. Minahani Mili, where do we know this from? Amar of Adabar Ahava da Omar Kra, Kol Hadabar Hagodol Yaviwa Elacha, Devarab Shal Gadol. There's a, there's a statement that when Moshe Rabbeinu was appointing a judiciary based on his father in law Yisro's advice, uh, Yisro told him any big matter they should bring to you. Um, and any small matter, let them judge on their own, the, small, the lesser judges. So the, what is the word big matter? It means the matter of a big person, meaning when you're dealing with a VIP, they should go to you, Moshe. You, Moshe, represent the supreme authority, and in the absence of Moshe, the Sanhedrin of 71 represents the supreme authority. May say, let's show a b'risa that contradicts that. Davar gadol, davar kasha. The word davar gadol, says the b'risa, means a difficult case. Not a VIP. Maybe no. Maybe you'll think that it means a VIP. So to dispel that, that's the I think the more correct girsa. So um, the Bryce says that no. That no, the, there's another pasuk that says any difficult matter they brought to Moshe. So we therefore see that the words davar gadol means not VIPs, but rather means difficult matters. <clears throat> so the Gemara says who da amar ki haitan. So th- again, we have a question: How can you tell me that we learn it from there when the Brisa says explicitly it does not refer to VIPs, but rather refers to difficult matters? The Gemara answer is who da amar ki haitan a detanya davar gadol davar shel gadol. So this price this is just the opposite of the previous price. It says that the words davar gadol means a VIP. Maybe you'll tell me that it means dif- a difficult matter and not a VIP. So kishu omer hadavar hakasha or davar kasha omer. Amani mekayim davar gadol davar shel gadol. So why then would the Torah have to repeat that by saying davar kasha, a difficult matter? So we see that a davar gadol is one thing and a davar kasha is a different thing. Davar kashe means a difficult issue, and davar gadol means when you're dealing with a VIP. And that's the b'risa that Rav Adabar Ahab is relying on to tell me that that's how I know that a Kohen Gadol has to be judged by a Sanhedrin of 71. So now the Gemara says, well, let's go back to that first b'risa. That first b'risa should, be, should bother us. Why does the first b'risa say that the words davar gadol and davar kashe mean exactly the same thing? Why would the Torah have to write it twice if they mean the same thing? The Gemara answer is, It's telling you that Yisro told him what to do, any big matter, right? And then the Torah relates the narrative that that's exactly what happened. Moshe carried it out, and any big, any difficult matter they brought to him. But really, big matter and difficult matter really mean the same thing. 
the Idach, but the latter Brisa disagrees. The bright latter Brisa says, Im Kane, licht of O Gadol Gadol, O Kashe Kashe, my Gadol, my Kashe, Shmami no Tarte. Why would the Torah write two different words to mean the same thing? Be consistent. If they both mean the same thing, that they mean difficult issues, then they should have written Dover Gadol both times or Dover Kasha both times. But why do you have to write Dover Gadol for one and Dover Kasha for another? Clearly the Torah used two terminologies because it's dealing with two totally separate things. And that's how I know that when you're dealing with a VIP, he needs a basin of 71. Boy Rebbe Elazar, Shoro Shel Kohen Gadol Bekam, Lamisas Valim Didei Medamina Lei, Odilma Lamisas Valim Da'alma Medamina Lei. Next question. What about the ox of a Kohen Gadol that kills? Do you need a base din of, seven, of, of 71 because the Kohen is a VIP? Or does it only apply to issues of the Kohen Gadol's own crimes, but not the crimes of his animals? Amar Abayami, the Kohen Gadol, Shoro, Michal Dimamon of Shitale. Well, says um, Abaya, the fact that you only raise this question about when a guy sure kills implies that all other court cases involving a Kohen Gadol that are non-capital cases, it should be clear that you don't need a basin of 71. So the Gemara says, Pshita, yeah, obviously, why would you even think that? So Mahu de Temaho, because of Kolad Dover HaGadol, Kol Dvar Shogadol, Kamash because you might have thought that the words Davar Gadol means any time there's litigation involving a VIP, he should have to go to a basin of 71. Kamash Maman, that he does not. What just remains unresolved is, what will be the din about a shore of a coin gadol who kills? We haven't answered that question, nor will we. Let's go on. We're going to get to the bottom of the Yomit. Ein motzien v'chule. We do not go out to war unless we have the consent of the Sanhedrin of 71. Mino animili, where do we know this from? Amar rabbi avohu da omar kra v'lifnei alazar ha-kohen ya'amod. Um, there's a pasuk in the Torah that talks about Yehoshua taking the people out to battle. And it says as follows, He shall stand in front of Elazar the Kohen, Hashem, and he shall ask him about the judgment of the Urim Vitumim, meaning look at the Urim Vitumim and tell me what it says, and Alpiv Yetzu Alpiv Yavahu, they shall go out according to his word, and they shall come in according to his word, who he, which doesn't tell us he, who he is, Bechol B'nei Yisrael Ito, Bechol Ha'eda, and all of Israel with him, and all of the congregation. So who is who? It could be it's referring to Yehoshua, but in the absence of Yehoshua, who does it refer to? Ze Melech. This refers to the king at the time. Bechol B'nei Yisrael Ito, Ze Mashuach Milcham, all of Israel with him, can't mean literally the entire nation. It means the general at arms. This is the Kohen Mashuach Milchama, who is the head Kohen general of the, of the national militia. The Chol Ha'eda, and the entire Ada, what does that refer to? Zeh Sanhedri. This refers to the Sanhedrin. So we see that all parties that are mentioned in this Pasuk must consent to go out to war before you can go out to war. And this is our source text that you need the Sanhedrin's consent in order to go out to war. But one second, where do you see proof from there? Maybe that Pasuk is simply conveying to us that when you ask, when you consult the Urim Vitumim, <coughs> you need the Sanhedrin's approval or, or presence when consulting the Urim Vitumim. But not that the Sanhedrin itself has to uh, consent to go to war, just that they have to be present to preside over the Urim Vitumim ceremony, but that's really all that's necessary. Okay. And really, maybe you don't need the Sanhedrin's consent. So, Ela Kiha, the Omer of Achabar Bizna, Omer of Shimon Chasida. But rather, it's based on the following medrash, that Kinor Hayatala Lemala Mimitasur Shal David. This is a beautiful story. There used to be a harp suspended above the bed of King David. And Kaven Shehigiyah Chatzos Lai Laruch Tzifonis Menasheves Bo Bahayimenagin Me'elav. It was positioned in such a way by the King David's window over his bed that when a northern wind blew at midnight through his window, it would blow on the strings of the harp and it acted as an alarm clock to wake up King David. David woke up every night at midnight. That was when he woke up for the, to do, start his day. This is where we get the whole idea of Tikkun Chatzos. And um, he would study Torah from Chatzos until dawn. Kevin Sha'ala Amud Hashachar Nichnesu Chachem Yisrael Etzlo 
Amr lo Adonenu Hamelech Amcha Yisrael Tzrichin Leparnasa. At dawn, that's when matters of state came to see him. The ministers came to his chambers and said, um, um, uh, and they said to him, "Our master, the king, your nation Israel needs sustenance. So put aside the Gemara and please come take care of affairs of state." So Amr Lahem Lachu Vihisparnus Uzemize. He says, "What do you need me? Let everyone open up a shop." And sell and buy, and everyone will be happy. So Amrulo, Ein Hakometz Masbia Es Haari, the Ein Habor Mispale Michuliaso. They said, with all due respect, uh, King David, we're sorry, but you know our economy is not large enough to be self-sustaining. In other words, and the, the the analogy they gave is a fistful of grain is not enough to feed a lion, and when you remove dirt from a pit, you can't refill the pit with that dirt. You need extra dirt to refill it because it won't. It won't fill up to the very top. The point that they were making is, is that our economy is not large enough, our population is not large enough to be self-sustaining. We need to import in order to, to invigorate our economy. So, Amr Lahem, Lechu Pishtu Yedeichem Begidwit. Okay, let's send out our militia and confiscate people's property if necessary or engage in some commercial warfare, I guess. It's not really clear why a militia is necessary unless there were hostile neighbors all around. When the neighbors are hostile, then you have no choice. You've got to go engage in military exercises. So Yoetzin Ba'achitofel, so they went and took advice from Achitofel as the best strategy, because he was the wise man. And then Benivlachim Sanhedrin, they consulted with the Sanhedrin. So here you see clearly from this medrash that the Sanhedrin had to endorse the act of war. V'sho'alim ba'urim v'tumim. And they would consult with the urim v'tumim to ratify the Sanhedrin's endorsement. So this is the medrash that shows us that the Sanhedrin had to be an integral uh, component of the rights to go out to war. We still haven't seen it from a Pasuk yet, which we're going to see later on, but this is where we'll hold it for today. Emir Tzashem, you'll have the next daf on Wednesday morning. We'll resume, pick it up over here, and, uh, and catch up over here. Have a wonderful day.